And I welcome all of you then to the Center for Spiritual Living Midtown, where we are gathered here and, um, and almost in Midtown. We're like on the north edge of Midtown and in the uh, uh, Garden Hills area at the Rec Center. So join us if you're in town and want to come and be with us. Or if you're joining us online, thank you and welcome. We're glad you're here as well. We have folks here with us most Sundays from all over the world. And that's a really exciting kind of thing. So why are we here? We're here to celebrate life. That's exactly it. And this month we're celebrating the idea that a balanced life is a very powerful life. So we're going to walk through the four areas of life and living this month and look at what a balanced life may look like. But for now, know that wherever you are and whatever you're doing, life is the one thing that wants to show up in you. And it is constant and will always be there. And we say it every week. Such is the nature of life, that all it asks and all it wants is the opportunity to appear. You are that opportunity. So am I, and so it is. Whoever you are, however you name yourself, however you think of yourself, whatever pronouns you use, whatever groups you identify with, all of that is wonderful, and we celebrate it, and we recognize it, and we say, yay, let us support you in finding a greater experience of living right now, right here, whoever you are and wherever you are. So welcome. I'm glad you're with us. I'd like to hear more about what we are and who we are. You will hear it first from our practitioners and board as they share with you something of what we believe from the Declaration of Principles. I believe. I believe. I believe in one God. One absolute power and first cause to all things. I believe that this power is perfect love. And creates out of a desire to express love. I believe all thought is creative and how I choose to think creates my personal experience. I believe in the unity of all life. And the immortality of the individual soul. Forever unfolding. I believe. I believe. I believe in the eternal goodness. The eternal goodness of God. The eternal loving kindness. And the eternal givingness of God to all. And so it is. And so it is. And so it is. A practitioner, if you were hearing from the practitioners and the board, well, a practitioner is someone who knows the principles of new thought, the principles of science of mind, and not just knows it in their heads, but knows it in their lives and have used it to create a better life for themselves. There are also people who can do that for you, who can work with you in, in understanding more of what's happening in your life and therefore in that process creating a better life for yourself. Today we have the wonderful Barbara Guillory with us to share with us the life. Thank you. It's muted. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for that warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to say welcome to everybody here. Um, the energy here is just absolutely wonderful. Certainly appreciate it. And Lynn, thank you for the wonderful snacks. They hit the spot. <laughs> So um, I want to start with just a, a focus on the idea of vibrant health. In the teaching that we're here, there are four areas that we focus on. Wealth, health, love, and creativity. So any one of those areas of our lives if it's out of order, then it is going to impact all the others. So here's the reading that I got directly from Dr. Bob. Uh -oh. <laughs> and Dr. Bob, thank you for all that you do here. It's been a great. There is much said these days about the relationship of mind body and spirit. 
Historically, our teaching evolved as a teaching healing ministry. Principles and practices for, bribe, for vibrant and energizing health start in the mind and flow outwardly from there. So that is our focus uh, this morning, vibrant health. Um, again, one of the four pillars. But I like that it says it starts in the mind. So what is that path for vibrant health? And I'll speak again from my personal experience. For me, it has been better feelings. And again, I'll ask that you look to say, hey, what has been that path for you? Because the path is different for everybody. Why? Because we're all different. So your path, you would know. And of course, uh, it would be one that speaks to you. So for me, coming to this teaching, I had plenty thoughts about the world, about life, about people. And this teaching, and again, going to the classes, um, is where my development started. It is where I began to learn about who I am in this world, in this space. So throughout the teaching, throughout the classes, um, one of the analogies that came to me during that time was that my mind was like a bus terminal. When you have buses that are coming into the terminal and they come into the terminal and they come into the terminal, they're not leaving. So you're going to wind up with a lot of congestion. It's just the buses coming into the terminal, coming into the terminal, but the buses are not leaving. So it is the way I viewed my mind. I had thoughts coming into my mind, but the thoughts were not leaving. So I'm just collecting thoughts, collecting thoughts. And of course, as you continue to simply collect these thoughts, it creates and produce an unhealthy environment. Just as all of the bus is coming into the terminal and not leaving, it creates an unhealthy environment. You've got traffic jams, uh, unsafe conditions, um, dangerous um, possibilities. So it is with the mind. If the thoughts are coming in and we're attaching ourselves, our minds to these thoughts, then those thoughts begin to produce discomfort. Then we begin to feel the discomfort. Those thoughts, particularly if they're not healthy thoughts, guys, they begin to produce dis-ease. So now we have dis-ease in the mind, and this begins to produce dis-ease in the body. So for me, being able to say um, the thoughts come in, but the thoughts must go. The thoughts come in, but the thoughts must go. The thoughts come in, the thoughts must go. So I've learned not to attach to, to any thoughts, actually. And this has been um, a great um, practice for me. So I've been able to free myself from, uh, again, as you guys know, I was raised as a Catholic, so we learn this victim mindset is really, really good. We learn that this victim mindset is going to get us into heaven. So we attach ourselves to such. But again, coming to this teaching, learning the value of the treatment has been a godsend. Uh, meditation, um, silence. Um, again, it's different ways that you can relieve yourself of the thoughts that are bringing you discomfort, that are bringing you disease, that brings you into a place of vibrant health. So we, once we do free our minds from the judgment, 
um, from the pain, from the criticism, from the anger, from the resentment. And again, we all have these. Not to say that you can't have them, not to say that you shouldn't have them, but it is simply the attachment. The buses come into the terminal as they should, but they also should leave the terminal. Our thoughts come into our mind as they should, but they should also leave, particularly the ones that are not serving us, bringing us into a better place or allowing us to feel better about who we are. So I'll leave you with a question. What is that path to vibrant health for you? So I like to do a mind treatment for peace. And as we come together, we center ourselves in a space of peace. And in this knowing of the peace, of the oneness of the universe in and of itself, we can sense nothing other than what it is in and of itself. Magnificent expression of all that is. I am part of the manifestation of this magnificent, of this peace, of this goodness, of the source of all there is. And it is in this mindset that I can declare for myself an experience of vibrant health simply because I, as an expression of the oneness, I am a co-creator with spirit. And as a co-creator with spirit, my experience here and now in this very moment is an experience of vibrant health. It is throughout my body, I experience the wonderful spirit of vibrant health throughout my arms, my cells, throughout this world, throughout the givenness, throughout the affairs, throughout my family, throughout the city, throughout this universe, the full expression of vibrant health comes through me, for me, by me. And for this knowing of the universe and how it does work, I am so grateful. And so it is. So as we move into our music, what I want to invite you to do, if you're interested in, in pursuing this thing called health, is take this as a time to listen inside, perhaps close your eyes, and as you hear the music, allow your mind to just wander through your body, starting with your toes and working your way up. If there are any places and that seem to be giving you trouble or uncomfortable, that need to be relaxed and moving into that peace that she just guided us to, then allow that to happen as we listen to this beautiful song.
at the first of the four quadrants. Thank you for setting that up for me. I don't, I, Barbara and I don't co collaborate, but we're all in one mind. So usually the practitioner comes up and does my talk in a mini version, which is much more succinct and clear. So if you got that, you can nod off now if you want to, because you're just going to hear the same thing over again with more stories. So here we go, though, because one of the things that I really have always felt like would be so nice, I don't know if you remember, but when I was a kid, the, the whole Aladdin stories were a big thing. And I wanted an Aladdin's lamp. I thought, how cool that would be if you had one of those and you just rub it and out comes the genie and grants you three wishes. Although my imagined genie always had lots and lots and lots of wishes that, she, that he or she could grant me. And I thought that would be awesome and it would be wonderful. It would be a power within me that could create what I wanted to have. Well, one of our founding um, theorists or teachers uh, in, in this movement is uh, Genevieve Barrent. And she was a student of, of Troward, Ernest, uh, Ernest Troward, right, Thomas Troward. And uh, this is what she had to say about that. She said, the power within you, which enables you to form a thought or to form thought pictures is the starting point of all that is. That same power that allows us to think, that moves through us as thoughts and ideas, is the starting point of everything. It is your Aladdin's lamp. And she goes on in, that, in, in the rest of that, that part of her book to say, and that a way to think about it is to imagine it as an Aladdin's lamp. That it's the thing that, that the way you create and bring forth the genie and allow the genie to work for you is using your thought to create the pictures of what you really desire and believe in. That's the place that you start. That's the thing that you do. And that magic lantern within us comes forwarding with real energy and excitement and possibility. It's, it's quite wonderful how it, how it manifests and shows up things for us. She goes on to say, and, and she's right in thinking this through, that spirit and matter are two ends of the same thing, or two sides of the same coin. What we have in our thoughts shows up in our physicality, not because they're separate things, and that was Troward's big addition to the philosophy of the times, that everything going on physically is happening because of what's happening in consciousness. And this whole idea of creating uh, mental equivalents, or as he called them, spiritual prototypes in our minds and believing in them and letting them become the, the part, to use the metaphor from earlier, the bus that stays in the station with you. So that from within that place, it becomes a creative thing that can create in your body, in your physical world, in your physicality, the thing you wish to embody, the wish to have come forward and come forth. So, I, so we say all health, healthy vitality, which is what we're talking about, vital health, and the energy of our health starts in the mind. And that's... That means you have some power and control over your health that you may not have ever believed or known, or you may have forgotten about. That's been easy lately to forget about it, right? Um, so if we can say all health starts in the mind, then maybe all illness does too. Uh-oh. I don't like that part. I just as soon not be responsible for my illnesses. Thank you very much. I'd rather somebody else take charge of that. The devil did it. Yeah. And a lot of appeal to that other kind of religion that believes in dualities and two, two powers that work in the world that says the devil made me do it. That was my mother's favorite expression for anything that went wrong in her house or her life or anywhere else. Until she <laughs> hung out with me a little bit and learned a little more about this teaching and then that messed all that up for her. She never did quite figure out whose fault things were after that. My house, we always say it's asphalt. And it's laying around everywhere. Truth is, it's what we take in. So our illness does not stay in the mind, but it starts in the mind. 
And that, that idea can get distorted and misunderstood and twisted around if we're not careful. Because, I, I love it. Thank you, Barbara, for that, that metaphor of the bus station. Because what comes into our minds comes from all around us. We get it from, we get it from our families. What does your family believe about health? What are you taught from very young about health? Be careful. It's a dangerous world out there. Be sure you got your, your galoshes and your red coat and your heavy coat when it's cold and make sure you're covered up because you don't know when, when it's going to get you from the inside or out. We're taught for, by our culture that health is, is only maintained in opposition to illness. Think about that. Health is not the absence of illness. Because illness is come and go. You know, and you can't blame an individual for having a, a, any kind of health problem. I really wrestled with that for a while because I'm a minister. I teach this teaching. First time I got a cold, once I became a religious science minister, I was afraid to get up and speak because I thought everybody's going to judge me for being sick. Because it must be my mind that started it. It couldn't be that I just kept hearing about it's the cold season, it's the flu season, and therefore the flu season, cold season, I heard it and I must be a part of it. So there you go. I had it. Didn't even, it wasn't a conscious choice or conscious thinking. It's that stuff that we are just bombarded with from all around us that becomes part of the collective unconscious that creeps into our individual belief systems if we're not careful. One of the most insidious versions of that is aging. I know nothing about that. It is about as we get older, we start to believe that we are supposed to have these things. The average person may. I choose not to be a part of the average, even though it shows up in my life sometimes. And so be it. That doesn't mean I'm not healthy. My doctor asked me this recently. She, we did kind of the annual health thing, and she named all the stuff wrong with me. And at some point, she asked me, so do you, do you think of yourself as healthy? And I said, well, basically, yes. I mean, I hear those things, and they're going on, but I think of myself as healthy. And if I think of myself as healthy, then that's the experience I'm going to have, regardless of the other nonsense that shows up in my life. The other dangerous thing about this idea of um, that, uh, that it starts in the mind, that health or illness starts in the mind, is when we do see someone who's ill or has a problem, and we think, or we say, so what's wrong with your consciousness? Now, we usually ask it in a kinder way, or people do, well, what's in your consciousness? As if we're saying, what's wrong with you? And when you ask it of yourself, you have to be really careful with that question because it's, it's an easy step into rather than what do I need to know about what's happening in my life or what's wrong with me. And as soon as you think and say and feel something is wrong with me, me, my, my person, myself, then we've, we've lost the ballgame. You're not going to get health out of something that you're attacking in your own belief system that you're wrong, something's wrong, should have done this, should have done that. And then we start shooting on ourselves. You know, that is the, the, the 11th commandment. There were 10 that got written down, but the 11th was, thou shalt not should upon thyself. And so we've got to get ourselves turned around from some of that. But our, our stinking thinking, as we call it in some places, our distorted thinking comes in when we start thinking that, there, that there's something wrong about us there's something wrong in our world, and there's something wrong, period, because we have, are having different illness challenges. You know, we even sometimes think we are spiritually inferior. What's wrong with me? Well, the good news is there's nothing wrong with you, and you are such a powerful manifester of physical life that you can create these god-awful healthy illnesses, unhealthy illnesses, to prove it. 
And you can, you know, my grandmother, God bless her, I love her, she's on the other side, she's haunting me sometimes. She had a heart attack. Anytime, anything in the family seemed to be overwhelming to her. Or she hadn't heard from her kids in a long time. And she wanted to see everybody. And by George, she'd have a heart attack. And she'd get herself hauled off to the hospital and everybody would come from wherever they were living and we'd all gather in the hospital and everybody thought grandma was going to not make it. And we got so excited. I mean, she was amazing with that. I lost count of how many heart attacks she had. Truth is, in the final assessment, she was having anxiety attacks. And finally, one doctor said that and the family was so angry at that doctor, they never went back to that part of that hospital again because they obviously were not understanding my grandmother. The whole family was caught up in the value of the illness. She had one heart attack in her life when she was in her 90s, and that one is the one she left with. So, you know, it's like, come on. We, we get so distorted in our thinking, we have, we have created a world where illness pays so well. And it gets us so much that if we're not careful, we create it without intending to. Every time we touch the magic lantern and we start thinking and believing that this is valuable for me for some reason. It's fascinating to me that as soon as we find a cure and we eradicate a disease, another one shows up. And then it becomes a great big deal. And we've just been through this. I mean, we know it's just the horror of what we've, we've been through the last three years, where we were told again and again and again, we've got this sneaky thing that's going to get us if we're not careful. And so we all did what we should do and needed to do, which is honor each other and do our best. But I'm here to talk about vibrant health, not vibrant illness. Yes. And the same power that lets you create intentionally or not that vibrant illness allows us to create vibrant health. It is our natural state. It is what we are, well, you know that, you know it's your natural state to be healthy and to heal. Cut your finger. Not right now, please don't. <laughs> Cut your finger and notice how quickly your body starts to heal. Get yourself all into a stew about conflicting ideas or get have conflicting ideas going on in your mind or, or things that you believe in one thing or the other and see if your mental discomfort doesn't show up. And it shows up to say, hey, we're out of sync here. It doesn't show up to make you miserable or to give you a diagnosis. It shows up to correct you, just like the the infection stuff that might show up in your finger if you don't take good care of it. But immediately it starts to heal. And if, if, you're, if you're feeling healthy and in good shape, it'll be gone by tomorrow if it's a small cut. If it's a big cut, it might need a little help being stuck back together. And that's okay too. See, this is what my, my teacher Kennedy Schultz had to say about this whole thing. He says... We put our minds in a state of ease by accepting and believing only in ideas of ourselves as whole, as precious, and as worthy of wholeness. You know, <laughs> the, the movies about with the rain have kind of messed up the word precious. You remember precious? Precious. But you know, thinking of ourselves as precious. How many of you think of yourselves as precious? You'd be embarrassed to tell people, right? Hi, I'm Bob, I'm precious. Yes, you are. We would be so embarrassed by that sometimes. And yet, my desire, my hope for you and for me and for all of us is to think of ourselves that way. As precious, as valuable. Nobody else has been you before. Nobody's going to be you again. You're your unique self, and you bring a, a gift to the world that nobody else can do. And that has a value beyond measure. 
Whether you're bringing your gift to buy simply being in an, on the audience by sitting on a stump and doing nothing, or whether you're involved and engaged in the world in certain ways, bringing newness and, and greatness and great goodness. You're precious. You're valuable. You're the gold within. And when we had the ease of knowing that, I mean really knowing that, and then it leads to such healthy kinds of behaviors, right? If you think you're precious, are you going to not? Are you going to stay up too late watching television? Thinking it's more precious than you are because you don't need your sleep. Hey, you're tough. You can take it. I'm speaking to myself now. Yeah. But when I realize my value, how important I am to my life and to the world, I don't have any problem going to bed early and getting plenty of sleep and rest so that I wake up the next day feeling good instead of feeling like, how many cups of coffee is this going to take today to get going? Something that isn't necessarily that good for us, but I have no intention of giving up. Yeah. Hmm. The other one he has up there is wholeness. Thinking of ourselves as whole. Wholeness means nothing broken, nothing needing fixing, nothing missing. You're not missing anything. You're a whole beingness, just like you are. We'll talk about this next week, but you don't need old so-and-so to f finish making you whole. And if you go looking for that, you're only going to find another hole, which is really not going to work well for you. But if you're looking for another completeness, you can find someone to share that with. But you're whole as you are, and you deserve it. Well, I had a whole lot of beliefs growing up about health that were not necessarily along that line. I didn't deserve health because my father died young. His father died young. I didn't deserve to live longer than 30. Why would I? Just because I'm in a lineage, and in order to be true to my... To my lineage, dying at 30 was kind of going to be expected of me. No, I didn't think about it that way. I knew it was there in my mind somewhere, and I thought, am I going to live? So when I finished my sophomore or junior year in high school, I got out in the world and took off to experience all of living I could because I thought I'm going to be done at 30. And at 30, I was diagnosed with something in my lung that looked like cancer. And the doctor said, I'm going on vacation. When I come back, we're going to figure out what the treatment needs to be. Now, they didn't have CAT scans yet in those days, so they had this whole x-ray kind of process. I'm old. I've been around the planet a long time. So when I came back, well, while I was on vacation, I spent the whole time thinking about if I had 30 more years to live, how would I live? What would I do? How would I do something differently than I'm doing now? What are the things I'm just putting up with? Because I don't think I'm going to live very long. And when I came back, the doctor came back from vacation. I took off on vacation. We, he went on vacation. and we, we worked in the same hospital, so it was like, I can do that. I can't stand. I was working on oncology. I can't be around dying people if I'm going to be out to be in this bed over there. And um, I got back and they found nothing. They found a little deposit of calcium where there had been something else. Doctor said, we must have, mis must have misdiagnosed it. I'm like, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> sure. The thing that carried me through that vacation, not only was I working toward thinking about what I would do with 30 more years, I was also a good Jewish guy who was my therapist at the time. Started quoting New Testament to me. And he said, you know, there's a passage there, and I think it's somewhere in John, that says, nothing can separate me from the love of God. And then the whole long list goes on of all these things that, that might could separate us, and it says nothing can. Not height, not depth, not any of that. And I believe to this day that the reason I'm still standing here is that that sunk in, in a way. I was already a good Baptist, 
but that sunk in in a way I had not heard it before. And it wasn't, the love of God doesn't, is not something dependent on what I do, what I believe, what I think, or how I behave. And even if I die with this thing that they thought I had, I'm not going to be separated from the love of God. I wasn't afraid anymore. So how that translates to us is that that belief in wholeness, that belief that we have within us everything that we need, that we don't have to worry about whether we're going to be separate from God. We can't be separated from God because it's, a, it's the thing pumping life within us. It is the life itself within us. And when we really get that, vital health is the natural response. It's, it's our natural way of being. Kennedy goes on further in the book in one place to say that living day by day, year by year, in that ease is what he calls health. Doesn't say don't have, you don't have any diseases, you don't have any problems, but you live in the ease of knowing that you are whole, precious, and you deserve your wholeness, whatever the stories you've been told about. Even if you live in the, in, in the world that just had COVID, you're still whole and you deserve it. If you wear a mask or don't wear a mask, you deserve wholeness. And I'm not saying people shouldn't do or shouldn't, should or shouldn't do either one of those. You do what, what your heart and soul tells you you should do. And you live with whatever consequences go with that. But, but, but deserving the best deserving wholeness, deserving the preciousness that you are. That's where, that's where we get to, to dive in and, and sink and live. Now, this is not easy, folks. You live in a world, I live in a world that bombards us every day. All I got to do is turn on TV and I see 14 commercials about things I ought to be taking and eating and sharing and doing or not doing and what pills I should be taking and, and because of my certain age, this or that should be. And because of my certain age, people say things to me and treat me a certain way, expecting me to be sick, expecting me to be unhealthy, expecting. So we live in a world of other people's expectations. And this may be true regardless of your age. I'm not just talking to us oldsters, I hope. But, but it takes some work. And the work is getting very clear on what we believe about all of these things. Back to that spiritual prototype, or what Ernest Holmes called mental equivalent. Getting very clear about what is your mental equivalent of your health, not health in general, but your health. And can you believe in your wholeness? Can you believe in your preciousness? Can you believe in your deserving? And if the answer is not quite to any of that, then we have tools, tools to help get to that place. Tools called spiritual mind treatment, with which we just participated, which is taking, which is arguing with ourselves. We don't have to talk God into anything. It's already handed it all to us. We just have to be able to receive it. And treatment is a way of receiving more. Treatment is a way of saying, okay, if God is all there is, and it is love, and it is health, and it is wholeness, and the natural way of being is wholeness and health, then I can have that. And I let go of any idea that says I can't. And that's the non-denial step. And if that's really true, and I can start believing it, what's my natural response to that? Hallelujah, thank you. When that doctor told me you got 30 more, you got who knows how many more years, but you don't have to start checking out now. I went, yes! I was so grateful. Almost kissed him. Not quite. But you know what? It took me back to that list of things I was going to do. That I was thinking of how I would live if I had 30 more years. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Change coming. And a lot of change happened in the next two or three years while I got on the track that matched the way I wanted to live if I'm living a long, long time. And when I reached 60, I got scared. I thought, uh-oh, my 30, my 30 years is up. 
So I renegotiated with myself for another 30 year contract, which I am now living joyfully and easily with some challenges along the way, sure. The challenges that anyone faces when you've been around the sun as many times as I have. And when you go around the sun as many times as you're going to before you, you move on to another plane of experience. It takes mental and spiritual work. This, as, as Ernest said, this is not a get rich free teaching. This is not an everything for nothing teaching. You pay dearly for every step you take. And what you pay with is mental and spiritual coin. You pay with working out your belief systems, your thoughts, your ideas, and what you can honestly embrace. And as you do that, life unfolds accordingly. The real key is changing our minds. And Emmett Fox said, the real challenge is to change your mind and keep it changed. And I have to admit, because you all know me and I can't lie up here, well, I can, but I'd rather not. With some of the challenges I've had lately, my mind didn't stay changed. My mind got caught and lost in some of the crap, excuse my French, it's not French, sorry, French people, um, the stuff that has been coming at me and at us in our culture about what we can expect <clears throat> from our lives. We can expect to be sick. We can expect all of these things to be happening to us. We can expect a world where the viruses are going to get worse and things are going to get more horrible and blah, 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 blah. Not if you change your mind. Some of that may go on around you, <clears throat> but you don't have to take it in. You don't have to keep that bus in your bus terminal. I will use that from now on. Thank you. Yeah. So change your mind, keep it changed. Because, you know, there is one place in your life where you have absolute freedom. Freedom is something we talk about all the time. You have absolute freedom. And that's what you think. That's what you accept, what you don't. And even if it looks like it's not reasonable to believe what you believe, if it's your truth and you hold on to it, that's what your life is going to look like. And it can't be a pretend. I can't pretend to believe this stuff. That ain't going to work because your true beliefs are lying in your subconscious, which are going to come up and say, hey, guess what? This is what you believe. You thought you believed that, but you really didn't. You thought you believed this. But that's good. That's part of the work. Then you clear that out. Because your conscious mind has complete charge over that subconscious mind in the long run. In the short run, it may not feel that way. See, you have that freedom. And I invite you to spend the time it takes to know absolute vibrant health for yourself. To think about that, to live in that, to breathe it. And when you have that in your consciousness, you will do the behaviors you can find all that stuff out there about how to take care of your body. There's plenty about that on YouTube and everywhere else. You'll get that part, but you won't. You do it unless you have it in here and here that you deserve to be whole, precious, and complete. And so it is. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, I'm Vance, and I'm here to talk to you about prosperity. Prosperity is something that we practice, something that we'll be talking more about as the, um, week, as the weeks go on, something that a bunch of us are in class about right now, Prosperity Plus Two, and having a wonderful time finding and exploring even more work from Genevieve. And I... Um, Invite you to join me now as we talk about prosperity for us. Prosperity is, is as much a part of your consciousness as everything else. And this is our prosperity affirmation. I live in a universe of abundance. As I freely and joyfully give, I join in the divine flow. And all that I share with life returns to me 
multiplied abundantly. So it is. Multiplied abundantly returns to me. So as you give, you receive. That is what this center is, is uh, supported by, is your contributions and gifts. I invite you, we have a basket in the back. We won't pass it around because you're at tables enjoying your coffee, as you should. But it'll be back there. You can also do it, give online. The, the information was right up there. You can go to our website, cslmidtown.org. We have envelopes as well. Um, contribute. Whether you're sitting here in the room or out there, if, if you find value in what we're doing and what you've experienced with me today and with us today, then share that value back with us that we may continue doing this and continue to expand what we're doing here and now and going forward. And speaking of expansion, let's talk, let's talk about our announcements here real quick. Look, nope, not yet. Announcements? Do we have an announcement? Slide? I hope. Nope. Okay. Well, I'll just do them. So the announcement is that um, you nobody in the board even knows this. Sorry, folks. Surprise! Um, the first Sunday in March is March 5th. And 11 years ago on March 4th, this group decided to march forth and create a new and wonderful center of spiritual living here in Midtown. And we are going to celebrate that on March 5th. We're going to invite all of you who have ever been a part of our center to come back and visit. Come join us right here in this room or online or wherever you choose to do that. If you come in person, bring food. Yeah, we're going to do a potluck. So bring food. And the board's looking at me like, what? We're going to do that, and we're going to celebrate, and who knows, there might even be some door prizes and things that I have planned and cooked up for this thing. So come and, and see what happens. Come see your old friends you haven't seen in a while. It would be our 10th anniversary celebration, but at that time, we weren't in person. We were online only, so we're celebrating our 11th, and 11th is a perfect time of completion. So I'm letting you know that this is the way it is and what's happening. I hope to look forward to seeing you. If you'll join me now in our closing affirmation. I leave this place now knowing something better than I knew before. I go forth into the world with a heart full of love and a mind full of good sense. I look at the world in a greater way, knowing that I have within me everything I need to create the life I desire. I give thanks for this understanding, and I am grateful for the spirit of life that lives through me, and so it is. And thank you, Paul Gagnier, for writing that for us probably 11 years ago, so sometime in the past. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.